And now I am very pleased to introduce Mr. Terence Ortslin, founder of TSO and Associates, who will be talking to us today about global exploration and discovery trends. And we have a pre recorded presentation specifically for our event from Richard Shawdy, Managing Director of Minex Consulting. Terry will then take live questions from the audience on behalf of himself and Richard. Please help me welcome Terry. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you, thank you, Joanne. Great to be at this D event conference. Looking forward to the next few days. Uh, Doug, of course, uh, gets the limelight. He's an expert on, on the industry and our royalties, as well as the trends of the gold markets, as well as the corporate developments. The next speaker is from uh, state of Victoria, South Tiara, um, is in, in, uh, in Australia. He's an adjunct prof at Western University of Western Australia, as well, XBHB. And for the last 15 years, he specialized on strategic targeting of exploration globally, as well as what to focus on. He did different studies than everybody else does, taking the numbers. And in essence, the conclusions you will see at the end, junior miners discover and deliver, senior markets, senior companies buy, and the world of exploration is quite geopolitically oriented, with most of the exploration happening in North and South America and in Australia pretty well. But there are trend lines which we can actually roll and see the way it's gonna develop. I asked some questions to Richard Shotty. Um, at the end of the taping, but I'm sure you have some more questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at, uh, at the conference. Uh, my apologies for not being there in person. Um, I really would have liked to have been there in, as Quebec City is both beautiful and a very historic place. In fact, uh, it's actually the inspiration for why I'm giving the talk today, which is on the importance of the junior sectors in sustaining and growing Canada's mining industry. Uh, what I meant by inspiration is that uh, nine years ago, I was in Quebec City giving a, a keynote uh, address to the QMEA conference on very much the same topic, uh, the rising importance of the junior sectors uh, explorers and their key challenges going forward. Um, the reason uh, I thought it would be um, interesting to give a talk about again on this is to see how things have changed or how things have not changed over the last nine years and, and give a certain uh, update on what's going on in the industry and uh, what's happening in particular here in Canada. So uh, you can download a copy of this nine-year-old presentation from my website if you're interested. But uh, today, I'm going to, over the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about the following seven topics. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about the, the trends in exploration expenditure um, over, the, over the last uh, 45 years or so, uh, both uh, globally and here in Canada. Then I'll step into the number of discoveries that have been made around the world and uh, Canada in particular, uh, the location of uh, the discoveries that have been made in the last decade, um, who made those discoveries? Were they made by juniors? Were they made by majors? Um, more interestingly, uh, what is the quality of the discoveries that were made? Um, uh, the industry values the tier one discoveries, but uh, they're quite rare and where were they made? And if you understand the value of those uh, discoveries, you can combine that with the expression expenditures to come up with uh, an assessment of the value proposition for expression. Do we find things that are more valuable than the cost of life exploring for them? And if so, um, if not, uh, what does that mean for the long-term sustainability of the industry? And uh, the last point that I wanted to talk about was the uh, importance of having a strong exploration program here in Canada to sustain and grow the mining sector itself. And then I'll wrap this all up with a, sort of a, a summary of all of the above seven points. So if we go into what's happening in terms of exploration expenditures, uh, uh, 2021, um, the level of exploration expenditures is half that we saw back 
in the in the peak of the period of 2010, 2012. This chart here of global exploration expenditures uh, uh, for the world, uh, broken down by region, is in constant uh, 22 US dollars. And it shows how cyclical the industry is. It goes from boom to bust, probably on a seven or eight year cycle. And uh, the, the bottom of the industry in recent times was back in 2002, when only $3.6 billion was spent in the world. And that grew uh, to uh, over $40 billion uh, 10 years later, at the peak in 2012. Then it uh, dropped back um, to um, uh, $13 billion um, uh, by 2016. It's now reflected a little bit to $15 billion or so. It's uh, interesting to see uh, how Canada has gone over that same period as well. Um, in terms of exploration expenditures, uh, it too has been cyclical and uh, has gone from a high of $5.5 billion in uh, 2011 down to a low of $1.5 billion uh, just five years later. Um, one point to note between this chart and the previous one is that uh, Canada's uh, cycle peaks and cycle troughs seem to be about one year ahead of the rest of the industry. In other words, Canada tends to lead the, the sector uh, early into the booms, you early into the busts. So you're a good leading indicator. So uh, it's interesting to see that over that uh, period into the 2000s, uh, there was a 10 times real increase in expression activity. And uh, in the following five years, it went down by a factor of nearly four. So uh, it can be spread on the way up and it's pretty difficult on the way down. Okay, uh, in terms of market share, uh, this chart here shows uh, uh, the percentage breakdown of exploration ex expenditures uh, by region around the world. Um, in the 1970s and 1980s, um, um, majority of exploration activity was appearing in uh, the traditional countries of uh, Canada, Australia and the United States. In the early 2000s uh, was the golden period for uh, Latin America, which grew quite rapidly, and uh, followed by Africa. And then in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, uh, China, um, cognizant of its uh, metals uh, requirements, uh, spent a lot of money on uh, exploration domestically in China, uh, and they've pulled back since then. Uh, in, in that gap, you can see that in the last few years, um, Canada and Australia's uh, share has grown quite dramatic, quite substantially. So you could say that there's actually been a shift back to Canada and Australia, uh, in part driven by um, business risk issues and concerns, and also opportunity as well. Uh, just sort of breaking that down a little bit more detail in terms of Canada's market share um, over that same period. And you can see that uh, from a high of uh, nearly 35% in 1987, dropped down to uh, less than 11% uh, a decade later, rose again and bottomed out in 2013 at just under 10%. And has now doubled its share in the following uh, eight or nine years. It's now running at 20%. In other words, every $1 and every five spent on exploration, world is spent in Canada. And those changes in market share are driven by a range of uh, factors. Uh, firstly, uh, things like government policy, uh, the introduction of flow through financing, uh, certainly um, uh, stimulated uh, the Canadian uh, junior sector quite substantially. Uh, changes in business risk, uh, both uh, in Canada and elsewhere in the world, money flows to where opportunities exist. And uh, particularly in the case of Canada, uh, exciting discoveries such as um, Boise Bay and Diavik and Bacardi uh, certainly uh, generate a lot of excitement, uh, which leads to extra funding and activity in the, in the, in the, in the nearby areas. Uh, another factor which can change the, the, the exploration spend mix in Canada is the type of uh, targets you're looking for. Uh, Canada is quite big on gold, uh, but it's less so on bulk minerals. So as those commodities go in and out of favour, the, the level of expression activity on those commodities also changes. Um, and also investment opportunities and patterns. You know, Canada is, uh, is uh, an engine for raising capital, 
uh, which uh, then flows through into the local sector. Uh, in dollar terms, uh, these are all in US dollar terms uh, and adjusted for inflation. You can see that uh, Canada's uh, um, expiration expenditures have been quite uh, volatile and are now running at about uh, $3 billion or so. Uh, it's interesting to sort of uh, split that out by uh, majors and juniors. Now, uh, these numbers come from uh, NR Can. And they define a junior company as those companies and prospectors that don't really have access to sales revenues. In other words, they have to rely on the, the, the goodwill and generosity of their shareholders to fund their expression activities rather than paying for it out of revenues from mine, mining sales and revenues. So that's our definition of junior and senior companies. And you can see that uh, 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 with the uh, introduction of flow through financing in 1985, uh, the junior sector really took off in Canada and, uh, and has been quite a large player uh, ever since. In fact, over the last decade, from uh, 2011 to 2020, junior companies accounted for 44% of all exploration activity and spending here in Canada and are currently running at about $1.7 billion US versus $1.4 for, uh, for the senior companies. So if you look at uh, uh, Canada's exploration expenditures by commodity, you can see from this chart uh, that uh, 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 you know, the, the largest uh, level of spend is on gold exploration followed by base metals. If you break that down by uh, on a percentage basis, the trend becomes even more clear. That uh, since the early 2000s, uh, the share of activity or expenditures in gold it's just growing and growing. And that's driven by commodity prices. And it's currently growing at 65%, followed by base metals and uh, other metals, uh, such as lithium and uh, rare earths, etc. Um, if you uh, look at uh, over the 45 year period, you can see that commodities go in and out of favour. And in the late 70s, with the boom uh, in uranium prices, guess what? Uranium was the uh, flavour of the month at the uh, time. And with the discovery of the cardiac diabetic in the early 1990s, there was a large and sustained uh, expression uh, on, on, on finding similar deposits uh, for diamonds as well. But uh, the lack of success basically uh, has led to that market drying up. Uh, and uh, you, with the boom in mineral prices for, for coal and iron ore, there was a short period of opportunity there to uh, go out and explore for those two commodities as well. But the key message here is that, uh, is that gold continues to be the uh, main target of interest here in Canada. Going on to the second topic, which is uh, the number of discoveries that have been made. Um, you can look at it in terms of the size of the deposits that were found. Uh, over that 45-year period, I've identified 526 uh, mineral discoveries uh, of moderate size or larger here in Canada. And I define a moderate as uh, something with more than a pre-mined resource of 100,000 ounces of gold, 10,000 tonnes of nickel, or 100,000 tonnes of copper equivalent. And um, uh, you can see that uh, on average, uh, probably about 10 to 20 discoveries are made each year of moderate sized deposits or larger. Uh, and at first impression you see from this chart is that over the last decade there's been a drop off in, uh, in, in the discovery rate. But you really need to flag that this is based on incomplete information. It does take time for discoveries to, uh, to, to, to be uh, drilled out and recognised for what they are and to be reported to the public. So uh, it does look like performance has declined in the last decade, but that's not, uh, it's more apparent than real. And an interesting way to, to sort of uh, highlight that concern and that issue is that uh, if you compare uh, the discovery performance reported in my 2013 study here in Quebec City, which I put here in pink, you can, which stopped in 2012, you can see that uh, in the following years since then, uh, I've added a lot more discoveries to my database, and particularly in the most recent years, of that 2013 study. So uh, you can see there was a substantial under-reporting of, of discoveries in that earlier period. Um, 
in in the decade leading up to the uh, to that survey. So um, there's a lot of underreporting, and there's obvious reasons for that. As I mentioned before, it does take time to drill it out, and uh, appreciate uh, the size of the discovery and to report it. Uh, that's particularly so for major companies who uh, are usually quite circumspect about uh, showcasing their, their, their discoveries to let know they've got something there. So if you do that, uh, uh, you find that uh, you can adjust the numbers for uh, what I call as yet uh, unreported discoveries. And that 526 discoveries that I mentioned before grows by another 35 discoveries. So I see that, uh, that uh, the picture for the, the last few years here in Canada is a lot healthier than uh, what was suggested. So uh, when you take into account uh, those unreported discoveries in recent years, the general outlook for the industry uh, is not as bad or as dire as uh, some people make it out to be. So uh, as from that, you can see that on average, uh, the industry is, has been and continues to find around about 10 significant discoveries each year here in Canada. And uh, where are all these discoveries made? If you look at it on a global basis, um, this is from uh, my old 2013 slide presentation. Uh, nine years ago, uh, someone asked me the question, you know, where are the hot spots around the world? Um, in the preceding decade, I identified 10 spots uh, uh, just very quickly running through them. There was Alaska, Yukon, Saskatchewan for uranium, uh, USA and Mexico for gold, copper, uh, Northern Ontario for gold and copper, um, Latin America, West Africa for gold, Central Africa for, for gold and copper, China, uh, Far East Russia, and Australia. That was the picture 10 years ago in terms of the hot spots for exploration. If I go forward to, to my latest uh, outlook for, for the industry, and uh, here is the, the significant discoveries of tier one, two, and three deposits in the world uh, in the last decade. And uh, my current call on the hot spots for, for exploration success are again British Columbia, Saskatchewan again, uh, Northern Ontario spreading over into Quebec, Western of Quebec, uh, again um, Southwest USA and Mexico, again Latin America, again Africa, West Africa. Um, this time um, Central America, uh, Central Africa has shifted up into the Arabian Shield uh, in Sudan and uh, interestingly across into uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, a more sustained focus in Central Africa and Zambia and, and, uh, and the DRC. Um, and in Australia, there's been a much more sustained focus here in West Australia, China, and less so in Russia. So you can see that uh, there's a lot of commonality in where the hotspots are in the last decade to the preceding decade. So the story hasn't changed all that much in terms of where are the interesting, exciting places to go and make big discoveries. And the other sort of take home message from this is that over the last decade, Canada has three of the 10 hot spots for exploration. So uh, you are punching above the weight. Sort of zooming in on uh, North America and where the discoveries that were made over the last decade uh, by commodity, um, you can see there's a range of gold, copper, and uh, uranium um, that are being made. As I mentioned before, there's uh, three hotspots in Canada. It's northern uh, Ontario and Quebec. You can see that in a little bit more detail there. Saskatchewan, obviously, for uranium. Uh, and uh, the shift has been from the Yukon and Alaska down into British Columbia for, for, for copper. And then again, uh, Southwest USA and Mexico for, for gold and copper. So in terms of the tier one discoveries, which are really interesting, exciting things to people want to find, the, the real company makers, money makers, uh, only three discoveries were made in the last decade in North America. Uh, Red Hill and Gold Rush, uh, gold in Nevada, uh, the Taylor Zinc deposit down there in uh, New Mexico, and, uh, and uh, in Canada, uh, the Arrow Uranium deposit uh, in Saskatchewan uh, uh, in 2014. So only one of those three is in Canada in the last decade. And the other sort of interesting and probably disturbing, concerning issue is that it's eight years since the, the last tier one discovery was made in North America. Um, um, we should be finding them a lot more than that. 
So this brings me on to the next point, which is who made those discoveries? And uh, uh, we're giving away too much of a secret here. The junior families have overtaken the majors here in Canada. And you can see that so clearly in the following chart. Uh, the numbers have been smoothed out a little bit by taking a five year rolling average. But uh, if you look over the last five decades here in Canada, uh, the, 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 uh, the heavy lifting has been moved from the major producers over to the junior explorers. Uh, and um, you know, over the last uh, decade, 84% of all discoveries by number made in Canada were made by junior explorers. In the major companies, uh, the major producers only accounted for 9% by number. Uh, these uh, definitions are slightly different to, to what NR can use, just to tease out the story a little bit more. You can see that uh, in the black, which is the prospectors, uh, while romantic vision of people going out in the field and finding, uh, finding the next door body uh, was the case back in pre World War II, it really hasn't figured in the story in the last few, few years. It's the junior explorers that are doing most of the discoveries using modern scientific methods. And what's the quality of the discoveries that have been made? How many tier one, two, and three discoveries have been made? Uh, I, I really should get into some definitions of what I mean by tier one, two, and three. Tier one discoveries are a company making mines that are large, long life, and low cost. And as a rule of thumb, they've got 20 years plus of life. They generate the equivalent of a couple hundred thousand tons a year of copper or four hundred million ounces of gold per year. They're in the bottom quartile of the cost curve and uh, using 2013 costs and values have an MPV of at least a billion dollars at the uh, decision to build stage. And if you, you want to look at the expected value, uh, they're probably, if you want to discover one of those things, they're on average got a couple of billion dollars, 2013 dollars. An example of that would be the Aero uranium deposit um, done by Next Gen Energy in Saskatchewan. The tier two discovery is something that's got many of the characteristics of a tier one, but uh, it's missing one of the elements. Uh, they're not quite as large or as long life or as profitable as a tier one. They typically have MPVs uh, used in 2013 numbers of, of uh, between $200 and a billion dollars and an expected value of about $500 million. And an example of that would be Amorak, the gold deposit. Tier 3, so uh, small, but only get developed in very top of the business cycle. And they have an MPV somewhere between zero and a couple hundred million dollars, with an expected value of around about 80 to 100 million dollars. And then you have uh, the interesting but small deposits. Uh, these are usually moderate in size, you know, 100,000 to a million ounces of gold, and uh, have minimal value um, of the order of 20, you know, $10 million US in $2013. If you look at this chart, you can see that by number, uh, the tier one deposits are quite rare over the last decade of the 90 now deposits that were found in Canada. Only 1% or one of them uh, was, uh, was a tier one. Uh, that was the arrow deposit. Uh, there were 11 tier twos, made up 12% of the total. Uh, the tier three is made up one third of the total. And the unclassified, that's the moderate size uh, deposits, made up over half by number. But in terms of the value that was created in the industry, you can see the tier ones and tier twos made up the majority of that. Between them, they made up over 72% or three quarters of the total value that was generated from the industry. This is the reason why you look for tier one and tier two deposits, because that's where the money is. So if you look at it by number, uh, how many of those deposits were found over the, those uh, 45 years or so, uh, you can see that uh, the tier ones uh, occur on a fairly infrequent basis, maybe one or two in the decade, uh, whereas the tier twos and tier threes are a lot more common. So on average, uh, the industry should find two tier twos, two tier ones, sorry, uh, Per decade, and we've only found one in the last uh, decade here in Canada. So uh, we're, we're, we're not uh, we're not quite completely uh, keeping up with, uh, with our past record. I guess a fair comment to make would be that of the 11 tier twos that were found in the last uh, decade, one or two of those may actually grow into something that becomes a tier one. So there's always potential for the numbers to change. 
You can actually calculate the value of those discoveries uh, using um, those uh, valuations for the T1, 2, and 3s of uh, 2 billion, 500 million, 80 million, 10 million dollars. Uh, all those deposits, adjusting for inflation. And you can see uh, that uh, the industry uh, does generate a lot of value, particularly when these tier one discoveries are made. Uh, that a very uh, um, significant impact on, on the performance of the industry. So what is the value proposition for expiration? Does expiration create or destroy value? And uh, a related question to that is, uh, who does a better job? Is it the major uh, companies or the junior explorers? So uh, if you aggregate those uh, values that uh, come from, the, uh, from those discoveries that have been made over the last five decades, and then compare it against the expiration expenditure to find them, you can see that uh, during the, uh, from the 70s through to the early 2000s, um, especially due to those large peaks associated with T1 discoveries, the industry actually created much more value than the cost of the exploration activity. But that's flipped around in the last decade. In detail, uh, $27 billion was spent on exploration in Canada, but less than $18 billion of value was created from those. So that gives you a value to cost ratio or a bang for buck of 0.66. In other words, you spend a dollar on exploration, and on average, you only get 66 cents back. That's not a good investment. Even those numbers assume that, uh, that uh, some of those unreported discoveries are included in those numbers as well. So I, I guess I should put a health warning on these things to say these numbers are indicative in a possible learning. But even so, it does show that uh, the industry has gone from uh, uh, value creation to low value destruction uh, over the last decade. And there's a number of reasons and factors for that, and we can discuss that later. So in terms of who made the discoveries, um, who was it uh, using the NRCAN definitions of juniors and seniors? You can see that the junior companies have uh, dominated the space uh, in, since, uh, since the turn of the century. And uh, over the last decade, over 2011 to 2020, 84% by number of all of the discoveries that we know about were made by junior companies. And uh, they only spent 44% of the, of, the, of the expression dollars, so they certainly performed a lot better than the major senior companies. So normalizing that to 100%, you can see that very clear trend from, uh, from senior companies making discoveries to the junior uh, companies uh, doing all of the heavy lifting. And in terms of the value creation that came from those discoveries, you can see the same trend as well, that uh, much of the value that's come from, the, uh, from these expression successes is associated with discoveries made by juniors. In fact, over that last decade, uh, the, the junior companies captured 82% of the value of all of the discoveries that were made. And if you compare them side by side, you can see that uh, um, the, the junior companies have performed remarkably well. Uh, if you look at the bang per buck or the value to the cost ratio, that's the, uh, the value of the discoveries versus the cost of the exploration. Uh, over that last decade, uh, the junior companies uh, Accounted for $1.23 of value versus only 0.21 for the senior companies. When you combine those two together, you get an average of 0.66 for Canada overall. So you can see that the, the, the senior companies really uh, uh, dropped the plot, uh, dropped the story there, and the, uh, the, the junior companies did much, much better than the majors. Quite a key point about that. So, so the junior companies are, are in general uh, did pretty well in Canada. Now, um, but it's critical that, the, that their success is sustained into the future because um, every mine uh, has a finite life and you need to replace them with new discoveries, new deposits. And there's a long lead time associated with doing that. So you need to uh, start work on that now. If you look at uh, Canada's metal reserves, and these numbers come from... Uh, from NRCAN through to 2011, and my estimates from there on. Uh, in terms of uh, millions of tonnes of metal contained, you can see that uh, uh, the amount of proven and probable ore in reserves uh, associated with operating mines and deposits that are about to go into production. Uh, you know, there's been dramatic declines in the amount of uh, uh, zinc that's available, nickel that's available, lead in particular. Um, 
And coffers recovered a little bit and gold has jumped quite a lot in recent years through uh, discoveries and new lights coming on stream. <coughs> but in general, um, um, several commodities uh, have been running down in inventory, which is not uh, a good situation to be in because this impacts on your mine production. <coughs> so uh, if you look at uh, the production levels for, for all of those key metals, you can see that uh, with the exception of gold, um, all of the metals have pretty much declined over those, over those last 30 or 40 years. Uh, so uh, the, the relevance and importance of the Canadian mining sector, which is a, a key element of funding a lot of the exploration activities, really has uh, slipped, uh, particularly given that uh, overall demand for these metals has grown uh, globally. So uh, apart from gold, uh, the story for the other base metals is uh, a little less subdued, a little more subdued. Sorry. And if you divide uh, the reserves by, by the production rate, you get a sense of the remaining mine life for these projects. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, in our can stop reporting uh, lead in uh, 2012, uh, with uh, only six years worth of reserves left. Uh, with nickel, uh, we're now down to uh, less than 12 years of uh, uh, reserves in front of us, which uh, speaks volumes for operations such as Sudbury. Um, the uh, zinc operations have uh, maintained at about 13 years, only for cutting back on a lot of more mines. Gold is fairly short as well, even though we've had a large increase in reserves. And copper has picked up and it's got 20 years worth of reserves in front of it. Now, the sobering factor with all of this is that uh, uh, there's a long lead time associated with starting an exploration program and making a discovery. And there's an equally longer pro time period associated with making a discovery through to doing the feasibility study, uh, going out and getting the finances and, um, and, and building the mine. You know, the lead time for those two items could easily blow out to 20 years or more. So if it's going to take you 20 years to press the go button to build a new mines to, to Canada, and you've only got 15 years worth of reserves in front of you, that's a real concern for the industry. Which drives the reasons why, uh, why we need to have a strong exploration sector to keep that coming into the pipeline for. Where's the next generation of mines going to come from? So uh, that's the question I sort of leave you with. But uh, in terms of summarising the, the key messages from my talk, um, in terms of exploration spend, the industry is incredibly cyclical. We're just coming out of the bust part of the cycle. Um, uh, Canada currently makes up 20% of the global spend, uh, 3.1 billion US out of 15.3. Uh, in terms of Canada, uh, gold continues to be the main commodity of interest. Um, Junior companies here in Canada account for uh, over half of the exploration spend, 44% over the last decade. And um, in terms of the number of discoveries that were made in Canada, on average, we make about 10 significant discoveries each year. Uh, although there's uh, an apparent drop off in uh, the number of discoveries reported in recent years, don't be too discouraged by that because uh, the reality is it does take time to drill out what new discoveries. So as those uh, information flows through, the story should improve. In terms of the location of discoveries, uh, there are 10 hotspots around the world, of which three are in Canada. That's uh, Northern Ontario running into Western Quebec, uh, British Columbia, and Saskatchewan. Uh, in terms of the general location of hotspots around the world, it really hasn't changed much in the last 20 years. Uh, um, what was a hotspot uh, back in the mid 2000s is still pretty much a hotspot today. So, uh, so uh, if you're in a good district, uh, stay in a good district. Who made the discoveries? Uh, as I mentioned before, 44% uh, of the spend was uh, in the last decade was made by junior companies, but they actually accounted for 84% of the discoveries that were made in that time period. So they were very much outperforming uh, the majors. Major companies only accounted for 9% of the, uh, the discoveries by number. Uh, going into the quality of the discoveries made, of the 99 deposits made in the last decade, three quarters or 72% of the value created came from just one and 13% of the discoveries that are in the tier one and tier two deposits. On the industry, on average, the industry finds, should find uh, two tier ones and eight tier twos each decade. Um, 
that rate is fairly consistent over the long time period, but it's disturbing concerning to see that we only made one discovery of tier one status in the last decade and 11 tier twos here in Canada. Maybe one of those uh, tier twos will turn into tier one. I guess it's, uh, like I said, uh, it's a concern that it's, uh, it's uh, coming on to eight years since the last tier one was found in Canada. We should be finding them more frequently than that. And going forward, the majors will have to be relying a lot more on the junior explorers to find the tier one deposits. So if they're going to uh, have their pipeline fall, they're going to have to uh, uh, rely on the junior companies to uh, find and deliver those to them. The value proposition for exploration, if you looked over the last decade here in Canada, $27 billion was spent on exploration. But the value created from the, from the, from the discoveries, even after you adjust for unreported uh, discoveries, was less than $18 billion, giving a value to cost ratio for a bank per buck of 0.66. That's not sustainable. But uh, so the industry, in a general sense, has switched from value creation to value destruction. Um, but uh, it's important to note that the junior companies did much better than average with a value to cost ratio of 1.23 versus only 0.21 for the senior companies. So in other words, uh, the junior companies were creating value and the majors were apparently destroying value big time. So what's the importance of a strong expression program? As I just showed in, in previous charts, uh, Canada's mineable reserves for most of its metals, particularly its base metals, are shrinking and that's uh, impacting on mine production and uh, mine lives. So uh, if the industry is going to sustain and grow itself, um, it needs to find new ore bodies now. Gold is the main exception. So I guess really to sort of close out on this presentation, my concern or a key message for you is that there are the long lead times associated between the start of exploration and discovery and mine development uh, are critical. And uh, for the industry to be sustainable, it needs to uh, spend more money on exploration and shorten the lead times between discovery and development. Um, the Canadian juniors have demonstrated that, that they can create value even during the so-called excesses of the boom period and they can deliver the goods. So uh, hats off to them. Keep doing good work. Thank you very much. And if you want a copy of this presentation, you can download this and other presentations from my website at uh, minxconsulting.com. Happen to questions? Sure, yeah. Richard, thank you very much for the, all the input on behalf of the organizer at the event. Uh, these are very valuable input. Obviously, Canada also has uh, the Canadian ex juniors or the explorers also spend money in the other countries. Uh, do, you, do you see a trend coming back to Canada in terms of dollars by the Canadian, Canadian junior explorers? Number one. Number two is that, I mean, Will the trend continue low global scale? The US, Canada, Latin America, and Australia, we will take a big chunk of the exploration spending in the world. Is that because of the geopolitics? Is that because of the geology well, itself? How we well, by, by, yeah, well, by definition, uh, the junior companies don't have their own revenue base. So they have to rely on shareholders to raise funds. And uh, you know, one of the uh, strengths of the Canadian scene is the, uh, is the uh, is the TSX, um, the ability to raise funds, uh, particularly for junior companies, is critical for their success. Uh, if you haven't got the money, you can't go out and do exploration. Um, the junior companies, are, where they spend their money is driven by opportunity. Um, uh, they go where the rocks are good. Um, but uh, they have to weigh up those decisions with uh, issues of country risk. And uh, one of the trends that I'm seeing uh, elsewhere is the... Is the growing sense of resource nationalism and uh, higher higher taxes and royalties being applied. So uh, it's it's an uncertain time to be an explorer in difficult parts of the world. So I think that's part of the reason why there's been a flow back of expression activity into places, low risk places like Canada and Australia. But also at the same time, you know, there are opportunities there. So uh, it's, it's, it's a carrot and a stick story there.